There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. It's Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave. That's Tim. Today, we're going to take a look at supernatural news from around the world, and we'll be reading some of your stories, maybe sharing some of your calls. We don't know how this will shake out. You just have to hang in with us. Before we get started, Tim, I have to make... um, I have to make two two bits of news, sure. uh, two bits of, of uh, housekeeping, if you don't mind. Sure. First of all, um, when we name our episodes, it is specifically because a lot of the, the podcast companies don't like us to number. So when we name it uh, Ghosts of, of Walt Disney World or, you know, uh, uh, Monsters of the Deep, there may only be one or two stories associated with that. We're just trying to set that episode standalone. So each one is a special blank edition. And we just pick one of our favorite stories from that week to call, you know, to, to kind of denote that episode. So understand, it doesn't mean the entire episode is all about that topic. It is just one of the many cool supernatural news stories you're going to hear on that program. Uh, but we do that because we have to name the show something. It has to have a title. And this is our standalone. This is how it breaks down. So now you have a better understanding. You can uh, know that going forward. Very rarely, unless we say all black eyed kids edition or something like that, where we specifically denote the fact that it is all about this subject. That's the only way you would tell the difference. The other thing I've had a lot of people email Tim, you know what they're missing? What's that? Theater of the mind. I miss theater of the mind. Tim misses theater of the mind. Here's, here's a little insight for you folks. Um, if you don't write a theater of the mind and send it into us, we can't record a theater of the mind. Many of the stories we get are short little blips, something like, uh, Hey, love your guys show. I wanted to do this. Oh, by the way, when I was 12, we played with a Ouija board and while we were playing, we heard banging on the front door. We went and looked and there was nobody there. Well, that's my story. I've got more to tell, but I'll have to do that at another time. That's not enough to build a theater of the mind around. Uh, there are very few stories we get that are theater, of the mind, uh, heady and, and ready. So if you are interested in having your story presented as a theater of the mind, usually it's like uh, two to three pages of, of, um, story that we can do, but it has to be detailed, you know, give us something to work with. So Tim can put in the sound effects. If you're walking, was it a crisp morning walk, uh, along the leafy path so we can hear the crunch of leaves? Was it down by a near a babbling brook? So Tim can play a babbling brook in the background. Was, was there a baby crying from uh, a carriage nearby? What was it about that story that stands out? So give us those little insights, write it like you would a narrative for us, a, a, a ghost story book, something like that. But we only want your real encounters with the strange and supernatural. And if we start getting more of those more thought out, well-written stories, we'll go back to doing theater of the mind. We both love that aspect. It's not that we're cheating you out of it. Part of it was we just didn't have the time to put to it with me doing three radio shows, plus filming the TV show, all that Tim's doing with editing and producing and getting all the shows ready. It just, we just didn't have the time. Now that we've got a little bit more time, we're, we're more than happy to start whipping out some theater of the minds. But Again, we need your stories. If you've got a good, weird, strange, supernatural occurrence, happy, sad, funny, scary, and you want to take the time to write it as a narrative, usually two to three pages long and well-written with some paragraph breaks, Tim, I know I sound like a jerk when I keep asking for that, but it makes it easier for me to read than one giant block of text. If you can um, make sure that you hit that spell check so that I'm getting it right and just kind of check your grammar, put a couple of commas punctuation and things like that that helps out in the reading process as well so that's what we'll do and we'll start bringing more theater of the mind to you 
when you send us your stories written out that way. All right. So that, that answers both of those aspects. Um, and I'm sorry if you feel like you've been cheated and that we've been holding back on you. We're not, I promise you hear the stories. Most of them are very short and succinct. Um, so we'll start keeping the, the longer stories that we get and bring them into a, uh, a, a bigger, broader form into some theater of the minds. And once we do that, start writing now, we'll start working on them. So January 1st, in time for our 15th anniversary, we'll start kicking out theater of the minds on a more regular basis again. Does that sound fair, Tim? Giving yeah. people a chance to start writing in, get them to us now, we'll start producing them so that beginning in January, we'll start airing new theater of the minds. Sure. And if you're not familiar with what an episode of theater of the mind sounds like, I'll tell you what, I'll have Tim play a classic theater of the mind right now. The demon doll of Denver, the true life account by Linda Dawson. In the summer of 1977, a small house on the outskirts of our town burned to the ground, killing a little girl, her mother, and father. The only survivor was the brother, a boy just a few years older than me. It was a sad time and on the tips of everyone's tongues for months to come. The brother explained that his little sister had an unhealthy fascination with fire, and they were always rushing around to put out a new blaze she had started. This time, they weren't as lucky, and the flames engulfed the family home and left a black mark on our sleepy little neighborhood. Being 11 at the time, my friends and I set out to go explore the rubble. One day, a week or so after the tragedy, as we kicked around the piles of charred wood and burned belongings, you couldn't help but feel sad at such a loss of life. Surprisingly, amongst the debris was a doll, about 12 inches tall, just sitting there, sad and lonely without a home or a little girl to love her. At the time, I didn't think much of it, but it was the only thing not covered by the black, sooty aftermath. I scooped her up and decided to keep her in memory of a little girl who had died too soon. The smell of the burnt-out husk of a house stuck in my nose for hours, sometimes almost making me gag. I couldn't get the thought of the little girl and her family out of my mind. How scary it must have been, how painful it was, and when it was all said and done, all that remained was this doll. I placed the doll on my bookshelf alongside a few other dolls and knickknacks. She looked much older than my other dolls and seemed out of place, but it was a reminder, and one I would come to find would be a very painful reminder. That night I woke up startled. I, I couldn't figure out why or how I had been aroused from sleep so abruptly. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The house was quiet. I decided to get up and go to the bathroom and confidently strode across my darkened bedroom when my foot caught on something. It sent me ass over tea kettle and I landed with a thud and a sharp, sickening pain in my left arm. At first it was numb, then it throbbed, then pain came crashing in like a tidal wave and I let out a howl that woke my parents from a deep sleep. They ran in to check on me and found me sprawled on the floor, clutching my left arm and wailing in pain. When the light came on, I could finally see what had sent me to my painful crash. The doll had fallen off my shelf and I had tripped over it. Even through the pain and tears, I thought it was strange. The doll was not very large or heavy, but when my foot caught on it, it felt like an anchored tree root. I never even felt the doll move as my foot crossed its path. Now, the rest of the night was spent in the local ER, where I was told the bone in my left arm had snapped. They call it a spiral fracture, and they, they casted me up. When I got home and climbed into bed, I quickly looked to the floor to warn my parents to be careful as they left the room and not trip over the doll, but she wasn't there. She was perched back on the shelf where she had fallen from. I figured mom or dad must have picked her up and placed her back on the shelf earlier during my fitful, tearful fest. The next few days were quiet at home, nothing out of the ordinary except the fact that my dog, our Irish setter Rusty, would not enter my room, seeking love and attention as he always had. Instead, he would stand just outside the door or lay there pathetically looking up at me but refusing to enter. I then had a very disturbing experience. I snatched the doll from the shelf and laid across my bed, my head at the foot of my bed and my feet where my head belonged, and I stared at the doll. I thought it was funny, after sitting in all that burned out remains for nearly a week, this doll was very clean and had no smoky smell. A smell that still lingered on our block for what felt like forever. Then, as I looked into its eyes, I noticed something that made my heart stop. My eyes were as wide as saucers when I noticed. In the reflection of her big, glassy brown eyes, a little girl was standing in my doorway. 
I flipped around with a gasp, and to my utter astonishment, there was no one there. I was absolutely freaked out. I climbed to the head of my bed, put my back firmly against it, and called out, Is someone there? Hello? Rusty ambled to the doorframe and stopped. He lowered his head, and low, grumbling snarls started. I felt a wave of sickness come over me. I was so terrified I couldn't move. Rusty just stared at nothing and continued his snarl. Then, with a loud yank, he took off running down the hall and out of my sight. Thankfully, the dog's sharp cry brought my mom to my room to check things out. I told her what had happened, and she assured me I had made a simple mistake and it was my reaction and stress that freaked the dog out so much. Well, that seemed to settle me a bit, but I knew what I saw. I know there was a little girl standing in my bedroom door. A few days passed, and my parents and I had gone out for a movie and dinner. When we returned home, we were still laughing and talking about the movie Freaky Friday and how much fun it would be to swap bodies with each other for even just a day. I bounded down the hall to my room and stopped as I reached the threshold. There, strewn about my room, were the other dolls I had positioned on my shelf. The dolls were torn apart, fluff protruded from most of them, the heads were cracked or smashed. The only doll that seemed unfazed was the doll from the house down the street. She was on the floor, but she sat bolt upright. My parents came to see what I was so upset about. My dad walked farther down the hall and let out a loud laugh. We came running down to see what was going on, and our dog Rusty sat in the corner. His head lowered in a look of utter shame, like he used to do when he would have an accident in the house. Dad called out, Hey, buddy, what did you do? What did you do? Rusty just whimpered and lay down right in the spot he stood. Dad went over to scold the dog for tearing my collection apart, but this was so unlike Rusty. He never tore things apart, let alone my dolls or toys. We were flabbergasted. When Dad knelt to his side, he cradled Rusty's head in his hands and said sternly, That's a naughty boy. When he pulled his hands back, he had slimy traces of dog drool and blood on them. He then examined the dog's mouth and found scratches all along the dog's gums and many of them bleeding. Oh, he got himself good chewing on your dolls, honey, Dad sympathetically called out to me. He won't be doing that again. As Mom and I approached the room to clean the mess, we both stopped when we heard what sounded like a giggle come from my room. (laughs) We both just stared at each other, frozen. Dad brushed past us, yelling out, Well, excuse me, as he passed, laughing at his own silly imitation of Steve Martin. We walked into the room, picked up, and threw out the mess, and I grabbed the doll ready to put the lone survivor back on the shelf when I noticed her hands. Her fingers were covered in slimy dog drool and blood. I told Mom I didn't want this doll in my room tonight, so we put her in Dad's study, and we shut the door. We both knew we were acting silly, but it brought us some temporary comfort. Later that night, we all woke up to the sound of furniture being dragged across the floor. From inside Dad's study. We stood outside the door listening and in complete shock. It sounded like little footsteps, then something heavy being dragged or pushed on the hardwood floor. Dad got between Mom and me in the door and yelled out, I have a gun! You better get the hell out of my house! Dad, of course, did not have a gun, and I wasn't too sure he was ready to barge in and do battle dressed in his boxers and a keep-on-truckin' t-shirt and fuzzy slipper combo. Then, we all heard the giggle come from inside the room. Then the dragging noises stopped. Mom looked to Dad, and he looked surprised and whispered, No goddamn way I'm going in there. We went back to my parents' room, locked the door, crawled into bed, and waited for the sun to rise. When it did... Dad dressed more appropriately, went to the study to see what was going on. When he studied himself by the door, faithful Rusty at his side, he threw open, well, tried to throw open the door, but it wouldn't budge. Something was up against the door, and Dad couldn't push past it. He and Rusty went outside, and Dad peered in the window, and all we heard was him exclaim, well, goddamn. It seems the only thing propped against that door was the doll which was impossible. We had thrown her on a couch halfway across the room. Dad came back in, determined to open the door. This time, Rusty stayed far down the hall. Dad yelled out in a commanding voice, Let me in the damned room! And gave the door a huge shove, and it swung open effortlessly. The doll resting back on the couch where we had thrown it. Dad grabbed the doll, 
out of the room and said, that's it, this has to go. We followed him outside, he hopped in the car. We, of course, joined him to see what was going to happen. Rusty, relieved, just flopped in the yard in a sense of calmness. We drove down the block, my dad grumbling and mumbling the whole way, and he stopped abruptly in front of the remains of the house where workers were already lined up, ready to start clearing the area and bulldozing the structure. Dad hurled the doll at the house and stormed off to the car. We must have looked like a, a car full of lunatics. Dad climbed in behind the wheel, slammed the door, and we all turned to look, half expecting the demon doll to be following behind. That's when we saw the worker climb off the small dozer, walk over to the doll and pick it up, brush it off, and throw it in the cab of his vehicle. Mom said, we should say something. Dad just retorted that it was their problem now, and we drove off to get something to eat. It took me almost 20 years before I would even walk past that area again. A new house was built and burned down a year later, almost to the date of the last fire. It sat vacant until just a few years ago, when they began construction on a new house. And all I can say is, I wish them luck. There you go. That's theater of the mind. We take one of your stories and we flesh it out and make it dramatic and, and have the sound effects and music and all the cool stuff behind it. So that's what we can bring back. If you're interested, write your stories, send them in, in to me at Dave at darkness radio.com. You can also call in your stories. And, uh, if you've got a good story to tell and you can tell it in a narrative way, maybe Tim will just take your story and add sound effects to it. We don't know. It's up to you. You got to put the, the effort in as well. 651-300-4977 is the number to call. You can leave your three-minute message and tell us your paranormal encounter, and we'll play it on an upcoming episode. How's that sound? Good deal. I think so. Let's be a part of that. Now, Tim, getting into today's Supernatural News, we've got a story that's taking place right here in our backyard. Really? Yeah, joining us on the line, Wayne Ganaway is here with us. Wayne, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me, Dave. Appreciate it. Well, I know you're you're a buddy, uh, a friend with a mutual friend of ours, Guy Hammernick, who wrote the theme song for our radio show. Um, and he's been talking for years about, oh, I got to get you guys together and and introduce you. Um, he's the executive director of the History Center for Olmstead County, and uh, you do a creepy doll contest, a costume pageant, and a virtual cocktail party, and you've got a cool uh, cool thing coming up. So let's talk a little bit about that and what people can expect and how they can get involved in that, Wayne. Sure, yeah. really quick background on it is last year, one of our volunteers was perusing our museum collections, looking for interesting artifacts to post on social media, and she came upon these uh, dolls and so thought, hey, let's put these on social media as contestants and our followers can, <clears throat> they can click and like which ones they think is the creepiest. And it kind of blew up. And as a museum nerd, I was not expecting it. And before long, we were uh, getting calls from Russia, from Canada, uh, CNN, you name it. And uh, George Takai if you remember Sulu from Star Trek, he even uh, gave us a shout out on Twitter. So Hi. it was a lot of fun and we decided to do it again. Excellent. So what exactly are you doing? How can people get involved in this? Because you've got a lot of stuff going on and people can be a part of this contest, correct? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have nine new, new old dolls from our museum collections and beginning tomorrow, we're going to be posting them on our Facebook and Instagram page. So the History Center of Olmstead County, uh, you can look us up on fa uh, Facebook and Instagram or go to our website, olmsteadhistory.com, and find them there. And you can vote for which one you think is scariest and creepiest. And what we're going to do is we're going to announce the winner of that contest at our virtual creepy doll cocktail party on Halloween night. That's awesome. And we have a link for the site on today's program so people can be a part of this. Where do you get these amazing dolls from? Well, that's the really interesting thing is these were dolls that go back in the history of Olmstead County, some going back to the 
1800s, someone loved these dolls. These dolls probably made someone comfortable when they were scared. And, and now these dolls to us look scary, but they're all from the history of Olmstead County. Really, at some point in the life of this doll, they ended up here in Olmstead County and uh, they were someone's toy. And so uh, times change and um, age changes things and people and, and maybe make them creepier as uh, time marches <laughs> no. on. It is bizarre, right? When you look at some of these dolls, you think this was meant for a child? Like your Frankenstein doll <laughs> and Mrs. Danvers. I look at them and I think, how did this ever comfort anybody? These are terrifying dolls. <laughs> That's exactly it. You know, and the other thing is, you know what? One thing people want to participate and they want to enter their own doll, which is really cool, but our dolls are divas, and they don't want to share the spotlight um, with other dolls, um, at least not this year. But people can participate by uh, joining our pageant, costu uh, costume pageant. And so they can dress up as a doll themselves, a creepy doll, and submit their a video or a picture of themselves. And they could be... Uh, win the crown as a, a, a creepy doll pageant winner. And that will also be announced at our cocktail party on Halloween night. <laughs> that is so cool. I'll tell you what, we've got to get together and maybe for next year, if you're interested, we can donate some of our haunted dolls uh, for the contest just so people can see some of the actual haunted dolls we've collected over the years. And I'll give you the little story. So, you know, it won't interfere oh, with would, what you've got. Yeah, you're, that'd be awesome. Your divas can still reign supreme, but you can have a secondary page of haunted dolls and some of their stories, and we'll include them. And again, there are some of these you look at and you, you realize there are a few of these dolls you think, boy, this could be a really cute doll, but it is terrifying just looking at it. So we've got a couple. I, I, I think I have probably about a dozen. I'll pick my favorite five or six dolls to send you photographs of and their story, and uh, and you can... Um, maybe even put them up on your page and, and share that with you, but we can, uh, we can expand your doll horizon next year and make it even more terrifying. How about that? Oh, that'd be, that'd be a blast. Yeah. Send us the pictures. This is, uh, this is really becoming a fun thing. And, and the more we can connect with all these other people that are into creepy dolls, it's, it makes it all the more fun. It, you know, what really is astounding to me, uh, Wayne is the fact that, you know, uh, we actually did a theater of the mind about a doll um, a few years back. I had this doll that was given to me. It had a very creepy effect. The eyes actually turned red on this doll. Ooh. I've never seen anything like it. And then I threw the doll up because my wife's like, let's just get that out of the house. And I threw it up on, on <laughs> eBay or on uh, my Facebook and a bidding war began on it. And I sold the thing and I've kept in contact with the guy and he's, he tells me every six or seven months, something strange that's gone on with the doll or in the presence of the doll. So it continues to, uh, create havoc and, and be weird. But then I've got all these other people always begging me for these haunted dolls. They want to know how they can get their hands on haunted dolls. And first I always tell people, be careful if you go on eBay and buy this, you don't know if you're getting a haunted doll. How do you, how do you, I, I always tell people, I can't guarantee you if I sold you one of my dolls, I can't guarantee you a ghost comes along with it, but I'll share the fun stories that go along with these. And and it really does capture people's imagination to have these, what should be heartwarming friends, these, these dolls that were created to be your companions and just realize how terrifying some of them looked and why that did not uh, register with the original makers that this doll looks horrifying and was really some of them you can look back at and realize how popular they were in their time. Yeah. You know, and you're right. It is the story that really brings the doll to life, so to say, right. Um, the, and I think that the scary story along with the, the actual doll can really, uh, put a chill up your spine. Very cool. Well, go check it out, folks. The link for this is taking place, so you can be a part of the Creepy Doll uh, contest, the Creepy Doll costume pageant, and the Creepy Doll cocktail party, and uh, be a part of this historic site that has been talked about worldwide. Go see some of these dolls for yourself. And again, just looking at them, 
I love the names you've given them. Uh, the Arsenic and Olay, Bella Lugosi, Frankenstein, Lady Macbeth, Mrs. Danvers, Shirley Jackson, Victorian, Stanley Kubrick, Squeaks. And Stanley <laughs> Kubrick is going to look familiar to quite a few people. Uh, <laughs> the Stanley Kubrick, is that because it's got eyes wide shut? Yeah, I'm the staff came up with those. So uh -huh. I'm not exactly sure why they came up with that one. Ah, it is it is terrifying. So very cool dolls. I hope people will check it out, Wayne. Thank you for popping on and telling hey, us about you. this and sharing it with our uh, with our audience. But keep us in mind as other strange things happen. Do you guys ever have any ghostly activity take place there at the historic society? Well, we do have um, some caves. We've got um, a, an old stone house and barns. I'm going to be honest with you, Dave. My antenna of the uh, a spiritual world may not be as strong as yours. So I personally have never detected anything. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean they're not out there. Do you have people ever report strange happenings? There have been. There have been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it's I no, I don't have a lot of details. But I like how you're dancing there's, the skeptic there's, line. There's a sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told I told Guy, our mutual friend, that um, yeah, Guy, I'm not sure what to think of it. But you know, I, my antenna just isn't that strong for for the spiritual world. Well, that's okay. When they want uh, themselves to be known, you will you will get that message, Wayne. Thanks again for sharing with us today. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you, Dave. Take care. Very cool, folks. So go check that out. Check out the link. Look at the dolls. Uh, see for yourself. And uh, you know what? Uh, screenshot or or right-click, uh, save the picture, and send us your favorite doll out of that picture. Who do you think is the creepiest and why? Um, I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on that. You can email those to Dave at Darkness Radio. Dot com. That's Dave at darknessradio.com. Uh, very cool stuff today, Tim. We've got a lot of weird news to report on, so let's let's get started with that, shall we? Sure. All right. Since we're talking dolls, Tim, I've got another one, another doll story to okay. share. And I'm going to actually include this story on today's news page. So if you go to darknessradio.com, click on the news tab, you'll find the story because it's a doll possessed by demons no. that appears to be crying real tears because uh -oh. we know demons are just such crybabies, Tim. Well, they're very sensitive, Dave. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see uh, what it says. A terrifying haunted doll possessed by demons began crying fresh water tears as she became upset as ghost hunters searched for ghouls at a bar. Paranormal investigator Matt Tillett was investigating at the hideout bar in Wrexham, Wales, when Annie, who he keeps in a box began crying for no reason. Maybe it's because he keeps her in a box. That could be, yeah. yeah. Holy flying beep! This doll is terrifying! Oh my god, <laughs> it Tim. is. Oh god, yes! <laughs> Here, ar ar prep yourself, at my fine furry friend. At first, I, gonna... I thought that was just part of the story. I didn't know no, that... I okay. just scrolled to the picture of this thing. <laughs> All right. And it's, I, all right, are you sure you want to see this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. it's in the article, folks. You can go see it for yourself. Mm -hmm. How'd you like to have that? Now I know why it's in a box. Look at that thing. Well, yeah, there's probably a reason it's in a box, sure. <laughs> Holy yeah. son of a, wow. Yeah, that, that's not something you give to the uh, to the kids to play with, I don't think. Oh, yeah. Lord, what, what do you do? What would you do, Tim? Mm -hmm. Right? You, 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 oh, you're babysitting your nephews and nieces one day. You hear one of the children in their room talking to somebody, and you know they're alone. You, you figure they're playing. You crack open the door. You peek in through that door, Tim, mm -hmm. and the child is sitting there, and this doll is standing on the bed in front of him, and the kid is talking to the doll like it's alive. How would you respond? I close the door slowly, and I go pour myself a scotch and soda. That's, That's it? Do. You just yeah. let the... Oh, no, yeah. I go in with a baseball bat and no, clobber that I thing. Just, uh, I let them talk, let them have their little talk, and uh, hope they're getting but along if, famously. But yeah. what happens, Tim, if as you're standing there, you hear him, you, your nephew go, but no, I, I don't want to kill Uncle Tim. <laughs> well, then it's time to arm <laughs> up because it's going to be a long night. And Holy I hope hell. that I get an extra dollar an hour for, uh, for babysitting. Babysitting? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well deserved. Yeah, yeah it is. 
<laughs> well, we've got yeah. so we've got a, a theater of the mind, classic theater of the mind today with a doll story. We just heard uh, about a, a doll contest that you can watch and be a part of and and participate in. And now this flipping nightmare. Oh, my God. The creepy toy is named Annie is reportedly possessed by a malevolent being, which Matt says helps bring forward spirits and activity during investigations. First of all, if I was a ghost and I saw this doll, I would tip the beep out, Tim. I wouldn't <laughs> hang out in a place where you bring this doll. Well, probably not, no. Now, at his most recent investigation at Hideout, he claims to have heard a ghost screaming. The sound of children running around, and he made communication with a 170-year-old cobbler. But Matt says he does not understand what caused Annie to become so upset during the ghost hunt. The doll that lives in a box and is fitted with paranormal equipment in the hope of proving there is life after death is now left with stains down the paintwork on her face as a result of her regular tears. Recently, Annie has begun crying for no good reason. She has real tears, Matt said. Would it matter if it's a good reason or no reason at all, Tim? The doll is crying. My guess is it's because none of the ghosts want to play with her. I've uh, had her for over yeah. a year now, and it's the first time she's had tears. I can't explain it. It's been happening since I put her in a new enclosure. I've sent it to demonologists, and they've suggested it could be one of the demons crying because they're trapped in a box and they can't get out. What kind of crap demon are you, right? <laughs> that you're tra- Ugh, I can't get out of plexiglass. Damn it! <laughs> right? Is that... What kind of weak ass demon is trapped by plexiglass? You know, you bring up a good point. I'm just saying. It's Do like you, Annabelle the doll. It's a wooden, crappy wooden box with a plexiglass front that says "Don't open." How do how does that keep a demon inside? You see demons throw around furniture, but you put them inside a little bit of plexiglass, and all of a sudden it's like a hockey player getting a five minute major and. Oh, in the penalty yeah, box, you know, you just, uh, there's nothing they can do. Yeah, your biggest bruisers are powerless when they're in the penalty box, aren't that's, they? That's right, see? Yeah. yeah. He said, I can't explain what's been happening, but it's ever ever since I put her in a new enclosure. I've sent it to demonologists. They think it's a demon that's sad that it can't get out. When we were at the hideout, she had fresh water running down her right eye. It's unexplainable. It can't be condensation because there's a big hole in the top. Then it's not really trapped. If there's a hole in the top, nobody can come up with an answer. It's a one of a kind thing that's ever happened. Nobody has ever seen anything like it before. The 32 year old who has been a paranormal investigator for the last eight years said he has owned Annie for the last 12 months. There's never a dull moment with Annie. She's always bringing some activity. He said she has two demons that are attached to her and they help bring forward spirits and activity on the night. Her lights were going off at the hideout, or yeah, her lights were going off at the hideout. So I think it was children that were trying to play with her because they like dolls. I don't know what child would see this, living or dead, and think, "Hey, I want to play with that." <laughs> After going through footage from the evening, Matt says he caught what he thinks is a woman screaming. You can clearly hear it. The noise is really loud. He said, "We think it's either a scream or somebody whistling to make us go downstairs." What? How do you not know the difference between a scream and a whistle? Ah! I mean, you could tell the difference between that, can't you, Tim? Well, it, maybe it's a whistle like a... And a... You know. I know, but you still you hear the... Just sounds like two different things. I don't know. The noise was caught in the flat upstairs above the bar, which has been abandoned and is nothing but an eerie place. I enter every premises as a skeptic. I won't believe it until I've actually seen or heard something. So for me, when I hear something like that, it's brilliant. It's something you can't hear with your ears. So when you're doing the investigation, we're oblivious to the sounds at the time. It's only when you hear the recording back that you can make out the noise. It's all to do with static electricity and frequencies. The frequencies are too high for our ears to pick up, but a microphone can because it can pick up all frequencies. During the investigation, Matt claims he also made contact through a Ouija board with a man named Luther Jones, who claimed to be a cobbler from the 1850s. Before the hideout was there, it used to be a cobbler's, he said. 
Oh, I love apple apple cobbler, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, cobblers are shoemakers, aren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a bit of false advertising. I'd go in looking for a nice hot piping apple cobbler, and I'd end up with a uh, pair of tap dancing shoes or something. <laughs> Now, we've searched the archives and records and searched people who lived in the area. He told us he lived in the building and thinks he still works there. According to the archives, he lived on High Street and died at the workhouse. I'm not sure where that was, but we do know he did exist. He also added, we found out there's a six-year-old boy who lives there with his mom and dad. Because the little boy was so young, he couldn't spell, so all he could give us was his age, which was six. We asked if his mom and dad were with him, and it moved the planchette on the Ouija board to yes, because of the spelling issue, we couldn't get much more from the little boy. So I've included this article, so you could see this uh, hellish doll for yourself. First of all, would you employ, I, I, I'm not passing judgment, yes I am, but Tim, would you, um, would you employ a demonic doll at a ghost hunt? Probably not, no. It's not one of the first things I'd use. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, probably one of the last things I'd use, mm. um, probably not, uh, the first tool in the tool bag. Yeah. No. Yeah. All right. Now the next two stories I've got are really bizarre, Tim. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of marrying true crime and the paranormal together. Are mm -hmm. you ready for this? I'm ready. Police body cam footage of Chris Watts's home has gone viral after some claim that the ghost of one of his daughters can be seen in the clip. The footage shows police searching the house for signs of Watt's wife, Shannon, and the couple's young daughters, Celeste and Bella, who at that point had only been missing for a few hours. Shannon's friend, Nicole, had raised the alarm after she didn't show up for a doctor's appointment that morning, according to KidSpot. The clip is be uh, already a disturbing watch, showing Watts lying about where his family were after brutally murdering his young daughters and expectant wife earlier in the day. But one viewer spotted something strange in the background of the footage, pointing out in a TikTok video called The Ghost of His Two Kids Are in the Room, that a ghost-like figure appears to peek around a door frame. The woman filming shouts, oh my God, I'm terrified, while the man shouts in the clip, his two daughters are in the effing room right there. Now, the clip soon went viral with over 640,000 likes and 7,000 comments, in a few days, Netflix viewers were relieved they weren't the only ones who spotted the ghost-like figure while watching the new docuseries about the murder of Shannon and their children. One wrote, I noticed this too when I watched it, while another added, I saw that too and thought I was crazy. But others struggled to make sense of it, with some claiming the figure is actually Nicole's daughter, who was with the police at the time. I wish people would stop this little girl in the room clearly has long hair. Both Cece and uh, Celeste and Bella had short hair. It's Shannon's friend's daughter, one person commented. But some remain convinced the shadowy figure is Bella or Celeste's ghost, arguing there was no way police would have allowed Nicole's young daughter at a potential crime scene, which makes a good point. There's a lot of paranormal evidence connected to that house immediately after their death on police body cams, one person wrote. There's an interview with him, Chris Watts, and he said the girl's ghosts came to him while he was in prison. So I've got this story up. The video part of it um, is not playable in the United States for some reason, but because I got this uh, article from the New Zealand Herald. Okay. But uh, you know which documentary it's in, so you can you can find it for yourself. And I've given uh, you know the article gives enough clues. Uh, but that's not the only creepy ass part of the story, Tim. Another article popped up. Hmm. In Netflix's Watts Murders uh, documentary, American Murder. Neighbor Nate Trinich's ring camera footage was followed immediately by the display of a fetus and a skull in oil, which uh, is kind of a creepy coincidence. Netflix's American murder documentary was popular enough in October 2020 to generate a storm of conspiracy theories. And among widely discussed elements was a purported coincidence during which Chris Watts is questioned by police and broadcast television playing in the background displayed a fetus and then suddenly switched to a skull with oil on it. And I'm looking at the images. It's pretty disturbing, Tim. Yeah. On October 11th, 2020, uh, the Reddit user shared a screenshot of images and wording matching uh, a less widely shared post. It said, Chris Watts stood next to the TV while the police questioned him. As they chatted, a fetus, then a skull floating in oil flashed on TV. Crazy coincidence? His wife, Shannon, was pregnant 
when he was when he murdered her and he put his two daughters in an oil tank. If you believe in paranormal stuff, was it Shannon giving the cops clues or was it just a big coincidence? Kind of creepy either way you look at it. In an updated message, it is written, I noticed this too, the fetus, not the skull. So I went back and rewatched to check. It is there. Interesting co- coincidence for the advertisements that pop up to be a fetus and then a dripping skull. Yes, it's real. You can go watch the entire scene for yourself. No, it's not photoshopped or conspiracy. Yes, I'm aware that it's advertisements and the skull is one for AHS, not random flashing images. The photo is just poorly worded. I posted because it is an eerie, strange, creepy coincidence, which it really is. As you're talking to him about what happened to his wife and and, uh, pregnant wife and children, for those images to flash on the screen behind is pretty weird. Yeah. Yeah, although American Murder has only been streaming for about two weeks at the time that Post began spreading, the rumor was not the first about a creepy coincidence or paranormal activity in the documentary. Again, they talk about the little girl in the background of the video. Um, one claims it is it is definitely a living kid, but it does seem strange that the police would let that little girl get close to an active crime scene. So, I don't know, bizarre. I'll have both of those articles up so people can go examine it for themselves and uh and see creepy coincidence or not tim it's pretty gd terrifying yeah, very bizarre is. yeah bo- yeah all of it is. yeah yeah our first email hi tim and uh sorry hey dave and tim that's how it starts tim i like that mm-hmm. he starts and then corrects immediately to the proper uh, way to present this uh, email. I, I have just finished listening to your excellent podcast from the 30th of September. Another fine achievement is always from you both, but I got rather disturbed concerning your, and forgive the intensity of the word ignorance with the regards to the temperature of beer. I assumed everybody knew that to appreciate the complexity and the richness of a cask, real ale, the correct temperature should be between 10 and 13 degrees Celsius. Only lager, and now I presume USA beer should be served ice cold, presumably to mask the true taste. Oh, Ooh, those are like fight words. Damn. And another thing, it's pavements, not sidewalks. Does Adele sing, don't go chasing sidewalks? No, she doesn't. And who would argue with Adele? I would. <laughs> Feel free to parody my very English accent. Great show. Hats off. Or should I doff my cap to you both? best supernatural podcast on radio adam that's adam from england telling us how to drink our beer i i guess he's from england because uh you know pavements it's it's just because you don't have proper refrigeration over there that you don't chill anything i mean you know i think you still hang your meat in caves i guess you know and this is a family show what what do you mean Hey, uh, this story <laughs> popped up in my news feed, Tim, mm-hmm. and it involves uh, a couple of friends. Oh, it does. It. Are you ready? For this? Yeah. Okay. Paranormal investigators have confirmed that Jackie O. Henderson's worst fears that her $11 million home is haunted. On Monday, ghost hunters Anne Retrowich and Renata Daniel discussed their findings on the Kyle and Jackie O. show after visiting Jackie's mansion in the leafy suburb of Willara. Now, Anne and Renata, Tim, are, are buddies of ours. We've seen mm-hmm. them at, at paranormal conventions, and they actually have attended a few of my foreign trips as well. Yeah. And here they are featured in a major news story that's being put out to the world. Well done, ladies. Very cool. They called the radio host a bit of a ghost magnet. Wait a minute. This is just a radio host as an $11 million mansion? What the hell are we doing wrong, Tim? I don't know. They call the radio host a bit of a ghost magnet and said that after 20 to 30 minutes inside the home, they discovered the property was very giving in terms of unusual activity and said that they were first setting up their ghost detecting gadgets. They were going off like mad because there was so much energy running through them. She explained that as they walked through the home, they were drawn to the living room where they used an ovalis, a tool that picks up on environmental conditions and spits out a word. The word happened to be Veronica. Renata asked if Jackie's daughter, Kitty, chose their home, to which the radio host answered yes. Jackie explained that while they were house hunting, Kitty wanted a cottage-style home, but changed her mind after visiting the modern-style home Jackie was interested in. All right. Now, Renata claimed that there was a reason for it. 
There's a child ghost in the house, and that's why she, Kitty, was attracted to this house, she explained. She revealed that with their equipment, they discovered the ghost's name was Veronica, and she was excited that there was a mother figure in the house. Audibly shaken, host Jackie asked, so this Veronica girl, she's excited that I'm there, that she has a mother? And also noted that she didn't think the ghost was likely younger than Kitty, a, a little sister for Kitty, after all this time, Kyle joked. Now, Jackie asked if she would ever have uh, experienced Veronica in the home, and Anne said, oh, you may hear footsteps up and down your stairs. Oh, no, I've heard this, Jackie said, but the thing is, I have an alarm in my house, so I heard this, and I thought, well, there's no possible way that anyone's in the house because the sensors would go off. Okay, I'm freaking out. I heard the noises of someone in the house, but I know there's no one there because the alarm would go off instantly. Jackie O says, Jackie also added that Kitty has a favorite part of the house, which is the stairs, which the investigator said made sense to them, given the ghost's connection to playing on them. They also revealed that the young ghost told them there was a male ghost in Jackie's home who would look after the radio host and her daughter. She also eased Jackie's concerns of any bad or malice energy, saying we picked up on nothing negative there. They love the fact that Jackie is there. They love the fact that Kitty is there. The little girl spirit is so excited that she has someone to play with, Renata said. Jackie recently moved into the $11 million property known as Cooper Park House after purchasing it in June. The private sanctuary was extravagant design and features including Roman uh, travertine marble and dark timber paneling. We are in the wrong business, Tim. Yeah. Paranormal radio does not pay to the point you and I could afford an $11 million home. It doesn't even pay to the point where you and I could afford to go look at an $11 million home. <laughs> we don't even have the gas money to go look at an $11 million home. Good God! Yeah. So, uh, I don't care that her house is haunted. Screw her and her rich house. That's what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that sounded bitter, but it's true. Um, let's talk real quickly before the break here, Tim. Uh, Blumhouse is releasing movies mm-hmm. um, from the Blumhouse. Uh, and and last week we gave a review of The Lie mm-hmm. and The Black Box. This week you and I had a chance to see the new movies, which are available on Amazon Prime. I watched the movie Evil Eye. And why I watch this movie, Tim, I was attracted to the fact that it's about a different culture. Okay. Um, these, uh, the, the family is, um, uh, I, can't, I don't know. I, I don't know the right terms. So I'm, I'm, I'm reticent to say this. I don't want to say Pakistani cause I don't know that to be true. Indian. I don't know if that's the proper terminology anymore. And I, I, am going to come off like some culturally insensitive dick, but, um, they they live in new Delhi and their daughter lives in America. And, uh, the premise is that, you know, maybe the sins of the mother are revisited to the daughter. And it's a really intriguing story that is definitely has a cultural impact as well, uh, a social impact. There is a, a double layer to the story of um, this mother who dealt with, uh, you know, she wanted her daughter to find the perfect man and believed that sh- this daughter should find the perfect man before she turns 30 because in in she's very into astrology and she has a, a specialist she goes to that looks into the psychic side of things and and really kind of says this is what your daughter needs to be doing and the mother's like obsessed with this uh having her daughter find the right man and we find out slowly why that's so important throughout this movie and there is a, a supernatural slant now I'm going to be honest, it telegraphs this concept, at least it did to me pretty early on as to don't, I wouldn't say don't watch the trailers. That'll give a little bit of it away, but just watching it, the movie unfold, you kind of get the feel for where they're going to go with the supernatural tale. And I think it's really, really well done. It's interesting to see, um, a different culture dealing with the supernatural and, uh, it's not just a bunch of white guys banging out this, uh, this storyline. It's actually written by people that are a part of this culture, I believe directed by that as well. So it's, it's got a really great vibe to it. Um, and it's an interesting storyline, but there's a socially relevant, uh, moral to the story. And that's all I'll say. Okay. I, I'm not going to give it as high a, a rating, um, as I did the lie, uh, you know, which I, I gave pretty good. I would say this is a good three, three and a half star out of five. 
Um, it's not because of the cultural difference between me and this. I, I thought it was well acted. I thought it was good. I just think that they telegraphed it too quickly. What was going to happen? And they, it, it seemed like they thought they were being clever, giving flashbacks to kind of start to piece the story together. But you kind of pick up on it right away, in my estimation. So because last week I didn't know where the story was really going to go, this week I, I kind of picked it up in the first 10 minutes. That's the only reason I kind of mark it down. Just I thought there could have been a, a more uh, more ingenuity used into telling the story. But it's a good supernatural thriller. It's on Amazon Prime Video now, so you can go watch it for yourself. Uh, but I think it's a good solid little thriller. I, uh, three and a half out of five stars for the uh, the evil eye part of the Blumhouse uh, pictures that are being released right now. You, Tim, you got a chance to watch um, Nocturne, yeah. which I got to tell you, I saw the preview for it and mm-hmm. I quickly jumped on watching the evil eye. So I'm glad you <laughs> took the bullet for me on this one. It uh, the, the, the preview didn't look intriguing to me, but maybe I'm wrong. Sometimes you can't judge a book by its cover. Tell me about Nocturne. I think you pretty much got up by the cover. Um, I, you know, it's it, here's here's the basic idea of the plot. You've got two twins, uh, two girls, um, Juliet and Vivian. Uh, both uh, twins are are somewhat. Uh, one is Vivian is incredibly gifted when it comes to music. Uh, Juliet. Uh, not so much. I mean, she's kind of mid-level gifted when it comes to piano. They're both musicians. They're both going to a, a gifted high school when it comes to music. Um, Vivian is ascending when it comes to music. And they have a friend who, in the beginning of the movie, is uh, playing, I believe it's the uh, the, the cello or, or a, a string instrument. And she gets a hold of a... a a piece of music um, and goes mad and I shouldn't say goes mad, but she, uh, she goes into the throes of mental illness and commits suicide while trying to get ready for this big, huge recital at the end of the year. Um, Well, it turns out that uh, Vivian gets a hold of this piece of music and decides that she's going to continue. And it's, uh, I believe it's Sansons that's that's the uh uh the uh writer of the piece of music or the the uh and and it it was Juliet that uh decided that she's going to do Mozart. Well, Juliet gets jealous of Vivian decides that she's going to she's not going to be the medium or or the middling musician anymore that she's going to upstage Vivian and you get her wanting to make this kind of Faustian bargain to upstage Vivian and hence the devil, you know, it's the devil made me do it. And you get the sibling rivalry and you get the, uh, you know, that's, that's where the devil comes into this and, and it's very predictable. We'll put it that way. But, but uh, the devil enters in through this, uh, Sanson's uh, piece of music in this book, this nocturne book uh, that contains the piece of music. Um, and in that, you learn that the devil has always been around. It hasn't always been in rock music. It isn't uh, rock music isn't or the blues isn't the way that the devil came in. The devil is, has been around even since classical music. And, and that in this piece of music, um He's entered into this this uh, gifted high school and has been taking out uh, students one by one. Um, and in that, uh, it's you find out that the the devil is is or you're assuming that it's the devil or Satan is is affecting everyone's life in our cast of the movie. The only thing here, Dave, is that. Um, the plot is very predictable. There's, there's no, it's not, it looked kind of pretentious to me from the ad as well. That was part of what put me off on it. It looked like it was trying to be an upscale 
Oh, it's very oh. upscale. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I don't know. If, I don't know how to explain it. Not that I want to be talked down to or dumbed down for a horror movie, but it looked like he was trying to are just in the the preview. Did it, did that convey in the movie as well? Yeah, yeah. It 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 does. Uh, there's times where it does want to be a little smarter than the room, and and that's okay. I mean. You know, it, it's sometimes it's okay to to be to want to be a little smarter than the room. It doesn't get too smart. That that's that's the thing. You don't have to be. You don't have to have a music education in order to appreciate the movie. It, that that's that's fine because it does kind of walk you through the the you know the the movie and in you know it, you don't have to know classical music to to appreciate the movie. Um, is this more of a horror movie or more of like um no no it's 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 more of a like a psychological thriller it's a psychological thriller there's nothing okay. too incredibly scary about this movie um and there's no jump scares there's no there's no real jump scares there's nothing really in fact if anything this thing lands flat it it does completely land flat and it is very predictable with that being said uh there's um Sydney Sweeney, who's the the lead actress in this movie, is actually very good, and and there are some performances in this movie that are very good, um, which is is almost kind of disappointing because the the I thought the script was 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 very predictable, um, and that that was dis- almost disappointing because there were some really good performances that were wasted in this movie. Well, with that being said, I would give it actually a two and three quarters out of five stars because the performances are very, very good. You're almost rooting for the actors in this movie to to do something to want to amaze you because the performances in it are very good. It's just that the movie itself is kind of predictable. The plot kind of languishes a little bit for you. Yeah, then. yeah, it does. It does. All right. Good to know. Uh, interesting. So you heard it right here. Um these not as good as last week's episodes, but still a solid, uh, solid entry point for uh, the Halloween season to go check out a couple of psychological thrillers. So last week, um, uh, the black box seemed to be more of a psychological yes. thriller, and so did the lie. This week, uh, Evil Eye definitely has a paranormal, much bigger paranormal slant to it. Um, I gave it three, maybe three and a half stars. I feel like I'm being generous with three and a half. Uh, so three, I'll say solid three stars. You're going two and three quarter stars for yep. uh, Nocturne. Yep. All right, check it out. It's on Amazon Prime Video. We're going to take a break. We'll come back. We've got more of your stories and more news from around the world right here on Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the program. This is Darkness Radio, your home for the best in paranormal talk radio. You can hear us here every Wednesday and Thursday with brand new episodes. Brand new episodes, Tim. That's that's what I like to deliver. Why? Because I love these people. I don't know if I've ever told you that, Tim, but the fact of the matter is these people, our listeners from all around the world, I love them. Oh, yeah. I mean, you should. I mean, I I want to cuddle them. I want to snuggle them. I want to make them feel at home. I want to just give them all my love. That's what I want to do, Tim. That's what I want to do. Is that is that such a bad thing, Tim? Well, unless there's restraining orders out, I guess it's okay. Sure. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, I love you people. We love that you share your stories with us. Uh, you can hear us here every Wednesday and Thursday with the best in paranormal talk radio. Every Tuesday, True Crime Tuesday. How do I find that, Dave? How do I find a good question? Just subscribe to uh, Stitcher Premium. Ah, Dave, I got to subscribe for your show again. Well, only for True Crime Tuesday. But when you subscribe, the $5 a month that you subscribe for with True Crime Tuesday doesn't give you just True Crime Tuesday. It also opens up the archives of Darkness Radio. All of our archives going back 14 years are open to you commercial free. And it gives you access to all of the other great content that's available on Stitcher Premium. So you're not just getting darkness radio and true crime tuesday you're getting all of it all of it and we have a special for you if you have not yet subscribed to the uh uh, stitcher premium 
go do it with the discount code darkness radio two words darkness radio you're going to get some deep dive savings for your first year subscription so go take advantage of that sign up and be a part of our world in a way that may never have been open to you before. If you want to get back into our True Crime Tuesday programs and listen to those, this is the way to do it. You could subscribe, and you'll get those episodes, all of our past episodes of, of uh, True Crime Tuesday, and all of the past episodes of Darkness Radio commercial free, plus all the other great content. So make sure when you go sign up for Stitcher Premium, use the code Darkness Radio. You're going to get deeper savings than you would any other way. So go take care of that. Two separate words, Darkness Radio, as your uh, discount code. Let's get back to it, Tim. We've got uh, news stories to share. Tomorrow, we're back. Wandering Wraiths, Pesky Poltergeist, and Unwanted Attachments. We'll be joined by medium Jim Hunt as we talk about his work in the field and dealing with these type of spirits. And uh, uh, we'll hear about his life his TV show and uh, all of the work he's done trying to help rid the world of unwanted spirits and help the spirits to heal and move on as well. That's tomorrow on the program. Let's uh, let's see what we got next here, Tim. Uh, this story again will be included on our news page. So if you go to darknessradio.com, click on the news page under today's uh, uh, news, you'll be able to find, and we, we post all the news that have stories that, that require video or photographs or audio or something that you want to see again, it's all going to be right there. Not every news story we talk about on the show, but just the ones that have video photographs and audio. So that way you can find them all in one place. So, uh, this next one, you can watch ghost hunters capture spooky scenes at Britain's most haunted hotel in Warwickshire, Tim. Hmm. An intrepid, intrepid. Mm. <clears throat> Let's try that one again, Tim. Okay. Take two. An intrepid ghost hunting duo is planning for a week of supernatural happenings this Halloween. If public health restrictions allow, Tim, the Shadow Warriors hope to revisit creepy Warwickshire, which they regard as one of the country's most haunted places. Bear and Wolf want to connect with the spirits and gather evidence in up to six places during Halloween week before deciding whether their spirit guides uh, were... What? How is this written? Bear and Wolf want to connect with the spirits and gather evidence in up to six places during Halloween week before deciding with their spirit guides where to go on the night itself, which falls on a Saturday, October 31st. See, it helps, Tim, if I take time to read the story a little slower. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's it was on, on me. My mouth and brain working in two different places right now. My brain uh, wondering when the McRib is coming back to America or more specifically Minnesota. Right. My my mouth uh, trying to read a story when my brain is focused on the McRib. So you can see the problem. I do, yeah. 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 The couple's previous outings include Coombe Abbey in 2018 where they say they took a picture of a ghostly apparition in a window. And they're fresh from an investigation at Eddington Park Hotel, a 19th century country house in stratford upon avon where they apparently captured evidence of a poltergeist activity as well as orbs tim and strange sounds hmm. <laughs> that's a strange four star yeah yeah the four star hotel was a setting for the 1963 film the haunting and netflix's follow-up of the haunting on hill house staff and customers are said to refuse to be alone in certain rooms and there are stories of guests fleeing in the middle of the night footage captured by the couple who stayed two nights at eddington which they regard as britain's most haunted hotel shows an eerie scene as the two tour the neo-gothic building bear is heard exclaiming oh my god what's that in the dark before a Bible is shown with the pages open on the floor of the library. She said, the first night was really quiet and we couldn't feel much energy, but the next night was just extremely bonkers. We found ourselves in the middle of the action when we were in the library. Is that the way they say it over there? Library? Yes, I believe it is. When we were in the library, a book was thrown at us and it happened to be the Holy Bible. A member of the staff told us the spirit throws books to warn people coming into the property that it's cursed. Even as paranormal investigators and spirit mediums, it was quite freaky and something we just didn't expect. Throughout this article, there are pictures and videos, so this article will be up on our news page. The couple who want to be known by their mediumship names plan to visit six places in Warwickshire over Halloween. 
though two uh, are currently closed due to the coronavirus pandemic. They are waiting to see which of the other venues will allow them through the doors in line with public health advice. Bear from Stockport and Wolf from Tamworth. That's cute. Differ from many ghost hunting groups because <laughs> they're also mediums and say they have spirit guides who help them reach the other side. I wonder if spirit guides ever fight. I bet they do. I, they probably have like bum fights on the other side. <laughs> bum fights. Yeah. They began ghost hunting after booking a romantic break at the Grand Hotel in Little Wando two years ago, Tim. Little Wando. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And saying that they found it to be haunted. Though they have been mediums since childhood, Bear said, we are not just ghost hunters. I don't know why I hiccup there. It's like I'm drinking. We are not just ghost hunters or paranormal investigators. We are also spiritual mediums. A lot of paranormal teams may use tools or equipment, but we go into places and we act as tools, Tim. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They connect with the spirits and check out the information with historians afterwards, which shows our findings are quite good. We read the energy and we use the guides to protect us because it can be dangerous to connect without having someone there to guide you. (laughs) The couple also use a spirit box, which is regarded as an otherworldly radio where spirits pick out words as a transmitter sweeps through stations and frequencies. Concluding their investigation in the YouTube video, Bear says, we believe Editing Park Hotel to be Britain's most haunted hotel. Do you believe it's haunted? We'll let you decide. And there's a link to the full video footage there. So you can find all that in today's article and hear just how accurate I am in my portrayal of their accents, Tim. I'm willing to bet 100%. Oh, dead on. Hey, Tim, we've got an audio daily double. Yeah. Jenna Bush is uh, the, the lead in this next story as she shares her creepy story of hearing ghostly guests in the white house she was recently a uh, a visitor jenna bush uh she's been spilling a lot of secrets about her time as first daughter in the white house and her latest is certainly fitting since it is october jenna's father former president george w bush served his term between 2001 and 2009 While she didn't live in the White House during this period, she was a college student living in Austin. She still spent lots of time there. And in a virtual interview on The Kelly Clarkson Show, Jenna confirmed all of those rumors about ghosts in the White House. Let's hear it from her directly. True or false? There are ghosts in the White House. True. (gasps) Never going. True. And and listen, Kelly, you would have liked these ghosts because they were very musical. They were musical and theme with no harm. They were kind, friendly, compassionate ghosts. So Barbara and I were going to sleep. Our rooms were right next to each other. And, and it was in college when people would call late. So the, our phone rang and I woke up and all of a sudden we heard like 1920s piano music coming out of our fireplace. And I was like, surely that's like the cat or something. You know, we had to pretend, but it was the middle of the night and you could feel the music out of the fireplace. And I know we tried to talk ourselves out of it, too. Like, I can see you. What do you think? Um, What I think is I would have immediately exited the premises. (laughs) (laughs) We jumped into each other's beds. Oh, terrified. But I'm telling you, the ghosts were musical and they came with no harm. I know, but evil. You say 1920s piano music, and that is literally like a horror film to me. Like, (laughs) late in the night, like that kind of music is like when you die, generally. Jazz piano. But I mean, okay. I you know you can't think it was from another era, but it was definitely terrifying. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, I'm good. I've been there once. I definitely won't be visiting again. I, I have a feeling you're not going to be invited there anyway, Kelly. Yeah, probably. Not. I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah. Um, so here's my concern. Jenna Bush wakes up to hear the sound of 20s music coming from her fireplace, and her first thought is, oh, it must be the cat. <laughs> What the hell kind of cat does she have that's like jamming to jazz music in the in the chimney? Uh, yeah. I, 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 maybe, maybe she's got a scat cat. I was going to say her cat was Louis Armstrong. Uh, no yeah. Idea. Yeah. 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 Could be. Yeah. Sounded a little bit like Rolf the dog to me, though, too. Well, it could have been. Yeah. I mean, Rolf is everywhere, really, in the afterlife, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dave and Tim, really big fan of your show. Just figured you guys might want to hear a story or two of mine. Oh, you were wrong. Thanks for writing in anyway, yeah, Brendan. Appreciate yep. it. Yeah. Yep. 
Our next story. Co- no, I'm just kidding. I'm really <laughs> interested in the paranormal, and it seems that whenever me and my friends get together, the topic always get brought up, and we all end up telling our same old stories that are always as interesting as the last time we heard them. Anyway, I think that two of my stories, of which I have many more, you guys might be interested in. See, he's at least putting it up front. I've got more, but I'm going to give you two of the best. I yeah. appreciate that aspect, Tim. Yeah. Maybe we could do a mini theater of the mind for these stories. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll try to involve some sound effects. You can involve some sound effects. All I right. feel like throwing a little MC scat cat in the background. Be it about that. Bop, zip, bop, zip, bop, zip, bop. I don't know. Are, are you saying you want me to create sound effects while you're reading here? Is that what you yeah, want me let's, to do? Yeah, let's do that. Ready? All right. I'm going to put you on the spot. Just you, This is the vocalizations and tapping talents of Tim Dennis <laughs> as we play along. He'll, he'll create the windy sounds if there's wind, thunderstorms if there's thunderstorms, well, I, clickety-clacking of a train. We don't know. In all fairness, I'm a little gassy. That's all you're getting for thunderstorms. <laughs> God. Now it says both of these stories happened to me. I honestly have no explanation for either. I'd also like to add that I think I'm somewhat skeptical when things happen to me, and I always try to find a logic. So that makes these stories even weirder. Today's Spot Theater of the Mind with Dave and Tim. The first story happened when I was around 15 and visiting the American Independence Museum in Exeter, New Hampshire. I was with my mom, dad, and grandmother. I thought maybe you'd hum like a musical uh, interlude oh, there, of oh. patriotic song. Sorry, That's okay. I, see, I, I dropped the ball right away. So yeah, I know. No, I know. You, you like to build up. You like to start off slow and build. I'm, I'm good with this. I was with my mom, dad, and grandmother at the time, and we were in the main house on the second floor just looking at exhibits. On the second floor, as you come by the stairs, there is a main room with, with exhibits and a hallway to your right. And one more room down the hallway that you can go in. It's the PA system in the background. Oh, I see. Sorry. And a room directly across from that one that's blocked off. I had finished looking at the exhibit in the main room and walked alone down the hallway to the last room. As I walked into the room, probably about 10 feet in, a large wooden door slammed shut behind me and latched. That's all it for a latch. I don't have anything. Very meaty latch. Yeah. When I when I say slammed, I don't mean the door shut slowly and closed and shut. I mean it sounded like someone literally used all of their power to slam the door shut and latch it. <laughs> I remember thinking as I turned around, holy shit, this door is not going to open again. Obviously, it did, and I was greeted to the sound of the rest of my family rushing down the hallway, asking me, what the hell did you just break? What the hell did you just break? (laughs) Is this family a parrot? Yes, they are. They're they're parrots and smurfs. I explained to them that the door just slammed shut behind me and latched to their obvious surprise. The first thing we did was to see if maybe there was something propping the door open and if it if I had accidentally bumped it out of the way, but there wasn't. We thought maybe the wind had pushed it closed, but the windows in the room were closed. After this, our only explanation was that maybe the old floorboards in the house had shifted and the door had pushed itself closed. <laughs> I recreated my entrance to the room, and we even jumped on the floorboards in the room to see if the door would sway, and it didn't. We kind of just brushed it off and finished looking at everything, went to leave the museum. On a whim, on our way out, my dad asked the people at the front desk if anyone had ever talked about weird happenings anywhere in the museum. They said there's not many stories, but... If there's one, it's on the second floor of the main house, down the hallway across from the old jail, which is the room that is blocked off. We told them, well, you can add another story and then explained what had just happened. Now, the second story I'll share with you happened when I was about 18 at my girlfriend's house. Her parents had gone away for the weekend and left us in charge of the house. We planned for a low-key night. 
<laughs> and had just had her best friend over to hang out. <laughs> Around 10 p.m., my girlfriend and her friend had to leave to go pick up one of their friends from a party. <laughs> At this time, my girlfriend had a dog, and they decided to take him with. Well, you got the dog going. <laughs> So I was left alone in the house. I remember I was watching Step Brothers in the living room on the ground floor. Did we just become best friends? <laughs> when I started to hear footsteps directly above me, which was my girlfriend's room. The footsteps came out of the room and walked down the hall, stopping at the top of the stairs. Not thinking anything about it, I instinctively looked towards the banister that led down from the second floor, and I called her dog's name and said, Come on down! Trying to get him to come sit with me in the living room. That's when I realized her dog wasn't there, and I was alone. I called my girlfriend, telling her she needed to come home now, but they were about a half hour away still from picking up their friend. My best solution to not hearing the footsteps anymore was to just turn the TV up to max volume and to drown out the noise of the footsteps. Honestly, not the best decision, but hey, I was creeped out and didn't feel like walking past the stairs to leave the house. The story doesn't end there, though. This past summer, me and my girlfriend's family were camping to just get away from the stress of everything going on around us. One night, I was just a little inebriated. Don't worry, I'm 22 now. And I was just shooting the shit with her and her younger brother. Kind of sarcastically, I asked, you guys want to tell me some ghost stories? To which her brother laughed. I said, hey, don't you laugh. I got some about your house, too. He replied, oh, I hear footsteps in the hallway outside my room all the time. Yeah, they just walk up and down and stop at the top of the stairs. I instantly got chills. <laughs> <laughs> I had never heard this, them tell the story before. He continued, yeah, my mom hears them all the time, too. I rushed to my girlfriend's mom and asked, why did you never tell me about this? She said she doesn't talk about it. It had just freaked my girlfriend out. I love your show, guys, and I wish you the best. Maybe I'll write back sometime and share a couple of my other stories. Until then, uh, Brendan. Thank you, Brendan. Yeah, thanks, We appreciate Brendan. your yeah. two short tales of supernatural splendor. Hi, Dave and Tim. Hi. My name is Donna, and I'm a local girl from Minnesota. I'm sorry, Minnesota. Minnesota, you know. I've been listening to you guys for a couple of years now, and I love your show. So let me get my fangirling out of the way and just tell you that your banter is awesome, and I especially love Dave's many accents and characters, and when he randomly bursts into song. <laughs> You guys make me laugh out loud all the time, and I thank you for that, and for being the best in Paranormal Talk Radio, of course. I wish I'd known about you guys sooner, because all things spooky and paranormal are my jam. Well, spread it. Spread your jam. Let everybody know about us. Now, I've been thinking about writing for a while now to share my paranormal stories, like you ask, and I had a key, uh, quite a few of them. I know you want us to call, but I'm just too nervous. I don't want to mess up a bunch of times and fill your voicemail and make Tim have to fix it. Plus, I can't wait to hear Dave read it. So in honor of Tim's television debut on Paranormal Night Shift, I thought the first story I should share is my own Night Shift story. Yeah. All right, Tim. Are you ready? Ready. I'm going to try to do our fellow Minnesotan Donna. As good as I can with this story now. Okay. I'm going to get everybody in the mindset. The paranormal night shift story from Donna in Minnesota. Minnesota. In 2007, I worked at a very busy corner gas station in Blaine. This is one of those stations with a small building in the middle with fuel pumps on both sides and a detached car wash. This place also had an incredibly old intercon system that was hardly ever used. The entire time I worked there, I only saw it used once. In fact, the first time I heard it go off, I didn't know what it was. There was this loud beep, and then this awful crackling speaker sound. You could barely hear the person speaking on the other end. It was distorted and creepy sounding. The manager came over and answered the call. She held down the button on this broken down looking speaker box and spoke into it. It was positioned on the counter 
between the registers. I never even noticed it until that day when it went off. Most of my ships, shifts, not ships, Tim, she's, yeah, yeah. she's not working on a ship. She's working at a gas station. Most right. of my shifts were overnights. Usually there were two people scheduled to work together on overnights. But on this occasion, we were shorthanded. I would have to work alone for a few hours. On one of those occasions, I was completely. Uh, completing side work, you know, cleaning. It was around 3.30 a.m. I was in the middle of the aisles mopping the floor when suddenly the intercom went off. Beep. The loud beep made me jump. I looked outside to see who the hell was using the broken down intercom, but there was no one out there. The speaker was on, fuzzing and crackling like TV white noise. I walked up to the registers, and I pushed the button on the box to shut it off, all while watching outside, trying to see who was out there. There were no cars at the pumps and no one around. Spooked, I locked myself in the cage behind the registers. Mopping was going to have to wait until someone else showed up. When my co-workers came in at 6 a.m. for their shift, I asked them if they had ever experienced the intercom just going off for no reason. Looking puzzled, they said, no. They said, in fact, looking it over, they had never heard it go off before. I told them what happened and why I didn't finish mopping, and they were completely creeped out. They said they were glad they didn't work overnights. The following week, I was working alone, and it happened again. It was around the same time, 3.30 a.m. I was cleaning up around the coffee bar. Again, the initial beep was really loud, and it made me jump. I immediately looked out the windows to see who was there again. No one, no cars, nothing. Annoyed, I walked up and turned the speaker off. I pushed the button a few times and said, hello. I picked it up. I shook it. I thought about disconnecting it, but I didn't. I couldn't figure out why it was going off. I gave up and went back to cleaning, keeping a close eye outside. When a few minutes pass and suddenly... I ran to the door, peering outside, and whipped around and ran to the other side, trying to catch someone, the speaker fuzzing and crackling away. I saw nothing. I went to the register, shut the speaker off again, and locked the cage door. I stayed there the rest of my shift, watching security cameras. They covered most of the lot, but not all of it. Still, I reviewed the previous hour and saw no one on camera. Coming or going? I don't know how or why this thing kept going off, but I do know that no person pushed the button. I know this isn't super spooky, but you know how things that happen when you're alone at 3.30 in the morning seem so much more dramatic? There was a panic button I could push to call the police, and they would be there within minutes. As creeped out as I was, I wasn't going to call them to tell them a ghost was trying to contact me on the intercom. Thank you guys so much. I look forward to listening as always. And if you'd like, I'll share more stories in the future. Happy spooky season. And that comes from Donna. Thank you, Donna. Yeah, please feel free. That's why we tell you to call in or emails. We want to hear your stories. I got one word of advice for Donna. Mm -hmm. if that ever happens again. You bless all the water in the car wash. You turn that son of a bitch on. You just let it flood the entire station. Wow. You get rid Less of the than... demon. Uh-huh. See how that works? I guess. Yep. Here, Dave and Tim, I believe this has never been brought up before. If not, here's my theory. In 2012, the Mayan calendar stated the world would end. Did it? Don't seem so. Maybe it did, but not like it sounds like. Maybe it ended, but all of our consciousness skewed to a different reality. Everything seems backwards. Negatives are positives and vice versa. Life just seems different. However, I can't say that it was 2012 when things changed. Thank you. You and Tim, Darkness Radio, are the only platform I follow wherever you go. Sincerely, Chad. Uh, Chad. I've often wondered that. What if uh, the reason things are so hellish now is because we all did die and this is hell? Hmm. That would explain why we don't get McRibs anymore, Tim. We're in hell. Whoa. Thinking about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mind blown, my friend. What do you think? Yeah, but we did end up getting a Portillo's. How do you explain that? 
Uh, but then there was a Portillo supposed to open literally, literally two miles from my home, Tim. And it vanished without a trace. No word of what happened. You can't. No word of why. You can't. That's putting me in hell. I have to drive almost 40 minutes to get to a damn Portillo's, Tim. Oh, 40 minutes. <laughs> Tim, I don't know if you're aware of this. The world is in lockdown. Driving 40 minutes, it's like, uh, it's like hell to me. You used to have to drive, uh, what, six, six hours, six and a half <laughs> hours, and now you drive 40 minutes? Oh, Tim, you don't even understand. You don't even understand, Tim. Mm -hmm. When you've got a family as large as mine, going 40 minutes to drive to a meal is, uh, it's like climbing Mount Everest naked with broken glass in your shoes. That's what a pain in the ass it is, Tim. Uh, why are you wearing shoes if you're naked? Because uh, I'm not a complete animal. Oh. Scientists are calling for a serious study of unidentified aerial phenomena. Do, 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 do. Phenomena. Do, 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 do. Unidentified aerial phenomena, Tim. You don't have to be an alien truther to be curious about recent UAP events. The U.S. Navy did admit recently that strangely behaving objects did get captured on video by jet pilots over the years, and they're genuine head scratchers. There are eyewitness accounts not only from pilots, but from radar operators and technicians, too. In August, the Navy established an Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force to investigate the nature and origin of these odd sightings and determine if they could potentially pose a threat to U.S. national security. The recently observed UAPs purportedly have accelerations that range from almost 100 Gs to 1,000 Gs, Tim. Means when it comes ripping over, everybody stands outside and goes, gee. No? Is that not how it works? 1,000 Gs was the name of my alien rap group. Was it? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Far higher than a human pilot can survive is where these things fly. There's no air disturbance visible. They don't produce sonic booms. These are other oddities that have captured the attention of the I told you so they're here UFO believers. But there's also a rising call for the phenomenon to be studied scientifically, even using satellites to be on the look light or a lookout, not look like Tim, but on the lookout for possible future UAP encounters. Philippe Alleris is a project controller of the European Space Agency's Space Research on Technology Center in the Netherlands. I don't, know, I don't know what accent I'm hashing together for the Netherlands there, Tim, but it came out. <laughs> I don't know, but they never, never did find the aliens because they surrendered before they found them. Wow. He also <laughs> is the primary force behind the Unidentified Aerospace Phenomena Observations Reporting Scheme, a project to facilitate the collection of UAP reports from both amateur and professional astronomers. There's a need for the scientific study of UAPs and a requirement to assemble reliable evidence, something that could not be so easily ignored by science, Alarius told Space.com. It is necessary to bring scientists objective and high-quality data, Alarius said. No one knows where where and when UAP can potentially appear, hence the difficulty of scientific research into this domain. New rules, new tools. Recent years have seen rapid advancement in information and communication technologies. For example, open tools and software, cloud computing, and artificial intelligence, Tim. Doom, 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 doom with machine and deep learning. Alaria said these tools offer scientists new possibilities to collect, store, manipulate, and transmit data. Alarius points out to another potent tool. The location over our heads of satellites is the perfect chance to potentially detect something, he said. Working in the space sector, it occurred to Alarius that Earth observation civilian satellites could be used to search for UAPs. One avenue is tapping into free-of-charge imagery collected by the European Union's Copernicus Satellites, an Earth-observing program coordinated and managed by the European Commission in partnership with with the ESA. Also, there are more than uh, more and more earth scanning spacecraft being launched to take the pulse of our globe. Such work is no longer limited to major countries or powers, Alaria said. Private sectors have also entered the planet viewing scene. And Tim, if you get tired of looking at our planet, you can always check out Uranus. Well, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not that talented nor that flexible. 
This evolution will stimulate forward-thinking ideas across different domains, including controversial topics, Solaria said. So why not search for UAP using this technology? Working with Alaris to employ satellite imagery to detect and monitor UAPs is Kevin Newth, or Knuth, a former scientist with NASA's Ames Research Center in California's Silicon Valley. He is now an associate professor of physics at the University of Albany in New York. We are looking into using satellites to monitor the region of ocean south of Catalina Island where the 2004 Nimitz encounters occurred. That's what Knuth says, referring to UAP sightings reported by pilots and radar operators based aboard the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz. That area will also be the target of a 2021 UAP expedition carried out by Knuth and other researchers. The goal of the outing is to provide unassailable scientific data that UAP objects are real. UAP objects are findable and UAP objects are knowable, according to the website for the project, which is called UAPX. The UAP UAPX team includes military veterans and physicists as well as research scientists and trained observers that will be sp using specialized gear to observe any would-be UAP. You down with UAPs, Tim? Yeah, you know me. I sure do. So that's what's going on. I think it's exciting. Science is calling for a deeper look into this phenomena, Tim. Do, 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 do. That's what I said, phenomena. Do, 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 do. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, speaking of uh, unidentified aerial phenomena, Tim, Blink-182's Tom DeLonge is going to make his de directorial debut with a new science fiction film titled Monsters of California. Now, Tom DeLonge, the former frontman of punk rock band Blink-182, is set to make his directorial debut with a coming-of-age sci-fi film titled Monsters of California. Monsters of California is said to be an adventure film with a sci-fi twist that follows teenager Dallas Edwards and his derelict friends on a quest for the meaning behind a series of mysterious paranormal events in Southern California. The truths they uncover begin to unravel extraordinary secrets held tightly within the deepest levels of the government. As you may already know, DeLong is very passionate about UFOs, the paranormal, and conspiracies. He was named UFO Researcher of the Year and produced histories unidentified inside America's UFO investigation. So it definitely makes sense that he would make a movie like this. He also wrote the script with screenwriter Ian Miller. The film stars Richard Kind, which you might recognize from Mad About You and Curb Your Enthusiasm, alongside Casper Van Diem from Starship Troopers, Ariane Zucker from Days of Our Lives, Gabriel Haw from Jeepers Creepers 3, and Sports Illustrated model Camille Kostek. Newcomers Jack Sampson, Jared Scott, and Jack Lancaster will also star. DeLong said in a statement, I've been playing this story in my dreams for decades. It represents all aspects of my strange existence, including growing up in San Diego suburbia as a disaffected teenage skateboarder. I had a tight tribe of friends who never missed an opportunity to piss people off and made me laugh so hard I would cry. The camaraderie, curiosity, angst, and irreverence is everything that led me to Blink-182, and this story is layered with my obsession with the tightly blurred lines between science and science fiction. The movie will be produced by Creepshow producer The Cartel, and founding partner Stan Spry said, The Cartel is thrilled to partner with Tom on this feature film directorial debut. Tom is a visionary and an artist who has transcended music, television, business, and is now taking the next step into film. It's an honor to work alongside him to bring such a fun and powerful movie to the world. So what do you think, Tom DeLong? I think he's getting opportunities like this, Tim, so that he stops looking to the skies. Think so? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You keep him busy directing films, and you can't worry about anything else. Well, maybe we'll have to worry about Death Walkers, Tim. Maybe. What is a Death Walker, you say? Well, it's a person who walks... Among the Dead. This Halloween, the all-new, highly anticipated series, Death Walker, drops exclusively on Vidi Space. Hosted by world-renowned paranormal researcher Nick Groff of Paranormal Lockdown, Ghost Adventures, and Ghosts of Shepherdstown. The new show focuses on Nick's solo journey into understanding different reasons why various locations are haunted. It's a very unique format where two locations are compared each episode, highlighting different paranormal theories where he delves into the concept of time, the impact of crime events, realizing not everything is a ghost, and expanding the definition of paranormal phenomena. 
Are you a Death Walker? You can check out the five one-hour episodes when they launch officially on October 31st. You can go pre-order and subscribe so you don't miss a minute of Death Walker. It is at Vidi Space, and that's V-I-D-I-S-P-A-C-E. And uh, our guest next Thursday on the show, Tim, is Nick Groff. We're going to talk about the show, talk about his experiences in the paranormal, where he has been and where he sees this field going. That is next week right here on the Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. How about that shaking loose a little nick groff looking forward to it the following week tim the powerhouse uh, uh guests we have do not stop amy bruni from kindred spirits and the special ghost nation reunion in hell will be our guest uh, talking about her new book and talking about the return of kindred spirits and the special reunion with jason hawes Steve Gonzalez and Dave Tango from Ghost Hunters. She was originally part of that show, as was Adam Barry. We'll talk about Amy's foray into the paranormal, how it has transcended what her original beliefs were to where she is today in the field. And then that's a special Wednesday edition. Thursday, Tim, that following week, the week of, of uh, Halloween, mm-hmm. is uh, going to be a big show. It is October 29th. Do you know what happens the night of October 29th, Tim? Uh, that's the day that I eat most of the Halloween candy and then save a little bit for the kids when they come around for Halloween. Well, while you're eating that candy, Tim, you can watch the brand new season of the Holzer files, which kicks off on travel channel. It's a late night premiere that night. Yeah. Um, and then we slip back to our regular time slot every Thursday after that. But right after you watch the ghost adventures tackle Joe exotics haunted zoo, you'll be able to stay tuned for the season to uh, premiere of the Holzer Files. And that's going to be an exciting new season premiere. I hope you guys will check it out. It is a great and creepy ass story. The Phantom Hand. We re- go back in and reinvestigate. But I'll uh, I'll have Shane Pittman and Cindy Keza join me on the show October 29th right here on Darkness Radio. We're going to talk about the new season. We'll talk about the old season. And if you have questions for Cindy and Shane that you would like to email in, just put in the subject line questions for Holzer Files. And I will uh, talk about those questions on the air when we talk with our guests. So you want to get those in the email to me ASAP as we'll be pre-recording that show earlier in the week. So again, Dave at darknessradio.com and just put in the subject line question for the Holzer Files and you can direct one, two, or three questions. You can direct one to the entire team or one to each one of us individually, however you want to do it. And I will read those questions on the air and uh, Tim and I'll be interviewing my fellow castmates about the new season. So I hope you'll check that out as well. So we've got a lot of great powerhouse guests coming up, Tim. A lot of great powerhouse guests. Sounds like it's going to be a, a busy and fruitful month, that's for sure. It is. Mm-hmm. It certainly is. Yep. I'm also, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'm going to be part of a Halloween special on Travel Channel, Tim. They talk to a bunch of us uh, Travel Channel uh, personalities about our favorite Halloween memories. I'll be on. Very cool. I'll be on. Yeah. It's going to be a good time. All right. Our next story, a spiritualist medium from Gloucestershire has claimed he has footage of a headless man captured at the New Inn on Northgate Street in Gloucester. The video was taken in 2015, so it's not really new footage, Tim. It's old footage that he's repurposing from inside the pub and hotel and shows a headless man moving past a window of the pub area. The spiritualist claims that the footage is the best yet to have been recorded at the historic venue, which was resting place for pilgrims coming to Gloucester in the Middle Ages. The uh, now-turned-author has documented all of the paranormal experiences he claims to have had. Johnny Angel said where the ghost was caught on the camera, they would have been walking through plant pots on a cobbled pathway at the time. It was suggested from an American medium that the spirits looked distinctively like an 18th century footman. He was allowed on Gloucestershire Live to use the footage after seeing previous stories on ghostly goings-on in the country. Uh, It started when the interest was sparked about the paranormal and UFOs in his teenage years. Mr. Angel said, I was reading the unexplained magazines at the age of 12 and would often be at a local library looking for either UFO or ghost material. I initially began to have a fascination for UFOs and alien life and joined a group of like-minded individuals as a teenager. I then realized I was now inside a psychic circle where all the adults around me were practicing elements of the paranormal and spiritual. Then he developed his spiritual skills over the years. 
He said, it was as a teen that I became involved in anything from mind reading activities to telekinesis, also mental bending or metal bending, psychometry and clairvoyance. Spiritualism was something which I gradually became a part of. The spiritualist had been teaching overseas before the pandemic. He said, I got stuck in among the COVID crisis and have not been able to return to my teaching and travels overseas. I do a lot of readings in Asia, though, uh, up to now, and have tended to keep a bit of a low profile. I had a premonition which gave me ultimatums. I choose to return before the COVID spread throughout the globe. A lot of supernatural and spiritual events around Mr. Angels. When he was on travels, Mr. Angels said they uh, things took a distinctively different turn whilst teaching overseas. From spirits of dece- deceased students knocking and appearing to visions of my students' lives and deceased families in the classroom. It became so intense that I decided to book a course and attend a spiritualist college for mediumship development in Stansted, Essex. There I took part in everything from platform mediumship through to psychic development. Later on, I noticed there was a lot of strange spirit apparitions appearing in my photographs and videos. Some even included my deceased pets. The Spiritualist has a book out, which was released in 2017. The book called Spirits in the Classroom goes into more detail of past experiences. So we do have a link up for that story in today's news section as well, so that you can go check that out for yourself and see the image of the headless uh, ghost, Tim. Headless ghost, I say. Cool. Yeah. God, I was headless as uh, I'm living. Now i got to be headless as a, as a ghost. Well, you know, yeah, so is in life, so is in death, I guess. I guess so. Yeah. All right, Tim, our final couple of stories before we wrap it up this week. Are you ready for this, Tim? Ready. A haunted rich guy story. We had to deal with Jenny O out in Australia dealing with uh, her haunted house. Well, a ghost hunter's paradise, nine-bedroom haunted mansion, once home to a millionaire businessman who fled after being terrorized by paranormal activity, is on the market for just $2.7 million, Tim. That's all. Oh, is that it? A haunted mansion, once home to a millionaire businessman who fled after claiming the estate was full of ghosts, has gone on the market for just 2.7 million pounds. The South Wing at Clifton Hall in Nottinghamshire was occupied for only eight months by Anwar Rashid and his family before they handed the property back to the bank. It boasts nine bedrooms, six bathrooms, as well as a library, chess room, drawing room, and ballroom. Charles briefly stayed in uh, the 1632. Oh, Charles the first stayed briefly in 1632. And according to legend, a woman's dressed in white jumped from a window to her death on that exact same property. The manor of Clifton was noted in the doomsday book of 1086 and the Clifton family inhabited the manor for over 700 years before it was passed over to new ownership in 1958. Mr. Rashid, his wife Nabila and their four children bought the house in Clifton, Nottinghamshire in uh, November of 2006 and said the first experience of paranormal activity came hours after the family moved in. He claims that the house then remained quiet for several months until one of the maids said she saw a gray figure sitting on her bed and claim the ghost started to take the form of his children. Ta-da-da. On one occasion, my wife went downstairs to make milk for the baby at 5 a.m. and saw our eldest daughter watching TV, the businessman said. When his wife went back to check on the child upstairs, she found her fast asleep in bed. The family also found red blood spots on the baby's quilt and left that day. Set on top of a hill with views of the woodlands and the river Trent, an elegant property is on the market of just $2.7 million, Tim. The mansion was uh, designed beautifully and features attractive examples of late Carilion and Georgian periods. The most interesting room in the house is the Octagon Hall, which was constructed in the well of the former watchtower and gives it its octagonal shape. The Clifton family sat in local offices and served as members of parliament. They had a very good relationship with the royal family. Charles I visited the property to see Sir Gervais Clifton, who was one of the first people to have a barnet created for them by King James I in 1632 or 1633. The property was used as a grammar school before Nottingham Trent University used the hall until 2000. A walk through these amazing corridors is a step back in time, Tim. So we can go back in time. Got to get back in time. Hmm. wonder if you get all the paintings and everything that's part of the house as well. It's gorgeous, but too damn many windows. Um... It'd be interesting if you did. I, I, I can't imagine that the paintings would come with it, though. 2.7 
million pounds. That chick that bought the $11 million mansion, that's just a drop in the bucket to her. Yeah, I mean, that's nothing. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. All right, uh, let's uh, take a look back at the hilarious moment that Lee Ryan freaked out as a ghost stroked him <laughs> and tugged his ear on Paranormal Ghost Hunt. Lee Ryan got the fright of his life when a ghost stroked his face and tugged his ear in a paranormal hunt. The Blue Star, 37, joined celebrity medium Adam Norton for a night of ghost hunting at the old Victorian school in Nottingham. The celebrity Big Brother star believed he experienced a frightening encounter while exploring the spooky building. Lee jumped out of his skin when he felt a ghost stroke his face, yelling, Something just touched my face! Something came up and touched my face! I'm not f***ing lying! The pop star took part in a new series called Call Me Psychic, which will allow Adam on or follow Adam on his escapades as he gives stars psychic readings. The one love singer admitted that he heard something in the toilets and then legged it. That means he, he ran to him. He got the hell out of there. Uh, yes. The star said, I felt something went over my face. Like I walked into a cobweb. It literally went over my face and like, oh, fuck this. I'm out. <laughs> the old Victorian school is believed to be the home to sinister presences that lurk in the darkness of the main corridor. It looks like Lee is not alone. The official website claims that staff and guests have been frightened by terrifying activity, including rattling doors with handles that nobody is on the other side of shaking, Tim. Hmm. Lee spent from 7 p.m. until 1.30 a.m. in the haunted building, but became increasingly frightened and freaked out by the mysterious goings on, including spooky noises. And footsteps on the stairs. So this this wussy gets stroked. His face gently gets brushed, and he's like, hey, fuck this, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm tipping out, mate. Gets a little massage, and he's out. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Sign me up. That's what I say. How do I get in for that deal? No. A little ghost stroking? <laughs> Name what? my new album. Ghost stroking? Yeah, ghost stroking. I got I don't know. Is that up by uh, Arista Records? Yeah, yeah. That'll be Very out. Uh, it'll be out this spring. All right. Finally, Tim, mm -hmm. our final story. A priest says he's faced the paranormal. St. Mary's uh, Paranook says that uh, not all experiences are evil, though. Things mysterious and paranormal were some of the topics St. Mary's Catholic Church's father, Mike Paranook, discussed during a recent uh, interview in his rectory. Pardon me? Yeah. He said he had witnessed some very odd supernatural occurrences that are nothing short of spine tingling from spirits and hauntings to dreams and people being possessed inside St. Mary's Catholic Church. Ornate accents adorn every corner of the building. The soothing colors of the sanctuary complement the rich history of the structure. Pale yellow, deep blue, and pink accents make for a unique and comforting atmosphere. Next to the church is Paranook's residence, the rectory. Inside the residence, dozens of vintage radios line the walls. Evidence of a devoted collector. Two portly cats bask in the warm afternoon light, shining in through the windows. It is in this quiet room that Paranek spoke of his experiences with ethereal presences. Dealing with the paranormal isn't an everyday occurrence for Paranek. Occasionally, members of the church request a house cleansing, in which Paranek uses holy water and special blessings to rid a house of evil forces. Although he has dealt with the supernatural more, much more than the average person, he is not part of any official paranormal investigative group. What I've done is that people call me as a priest to bless their house, Paranook said of the involvement with the spirits. He also has dealt with ridding of evil presences in humans with a series of commands in holy water. He said he has rid possessed individuals of evil. Paranook explained he experienced a spirit in the rectory where the interview took place. Father Stan Lerman, a former priest of St. Mary's, passed away in 2005. Paranook replaced him in November of the same year. As the residing priest, one day shortly after he arrived at St. Mary, Paranook said he found a tabernacle missing a key. Later, he returned to find the matching key resting on a nearby surface. I know it was Father Stan Lerman. Not all experiences are evil. Sometimes they can be quite helpful, Paranook said, gesturing toward a, de a de decorative container. Another time, during a restoration of the sanctuary, Paranook said Lumen appeared to him in a dream. Paranook said, Lumen or Lerman, instructed him to stop painting the ceiling ventilation grates pink because the color would show dirt. Peronik said Lerman commanded him to paint them blue. So Peronik heeded the instructions, and the grates to this day are still blue. Peronik's experiences with spirits are quite interesting and a bit terrifying. Not only has he had ghostly encounters, but he is said to have even received vivid dreams 
from the deceased. His encounters with the unknown are exceptionally rare and just go to show that not everything is as it seems in Highland County. <laughs> did I uh, did I tell you the uh, first single on the uh, on the album? Of, no, of, uh, do of, tell. Uh, Ghost stroking. It's uh, Ghost stroking. Yeah, Ghost stroking. Uh, the first single is a uh, little spirit in the rectory. Little spirit in the rectory. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's wrap up with a, a call, Tim. Okay. Again, if you want to be a part of the show, you can call our voices from beyond voicemail, just like this caller. Hey, Dave. Hey, Tim. Uh, first, I want to say happy 50th, Tim. Um, I've been listening to you guys since 2008. I want to say, I want to say uh, quite a while, and um, you know, I got to tell you, you've been you know, you've been my source of respite. Uh, in some pretty hard times. Um, and so you guys just have really become like family, uh, you know, to me and to those around me. So I want to say thank you for that. You know, I've had my own paranormal experiences. My first was back in 1987, I want to say, 86, 87. I was living in an older section of town in a duplex and a fully formed apparition appeared to me, not just once, but twice. Um, I tried to speak to it, not sure what. It was, a, it was a male. He looked like he was dressed as a lumberjack or some sort of um, old, tiny, you know, maybe, I don't know, stock worker. I lived in a part of Redwood City, California that was once a big port, lumber port town. And um, that was the period of dress that this gentleman appeared to me in. He always was in, this, he, twice he appeared to me, late at night, no rhyme or reason, just was out enjoying the night air, looked across the street at an older house, and there he was, uh, standing there behind a short fence, standing stock still and staring up into the sky, didn't move, didn't flinch. Um, and he was probably about 30 to 40 feet from me. Um, I could make out some pretty good detail. But again, never his gaze was fixed. Uh, never said a word, never saw him move a muscle. And it was early. It was midnight. The first time was, was midnight. second time was 3 in the morning. And at that hour, you can hear a pin drop. And I didn't hear anything, no swishing of the grass, no footfalls on the concrete pathway, no nothing. Um, but he was there. The first time I, I turned my head to call my then-girlfriend at the time out to see him, when I turned back, he had vanished. Uh, of course, the hair on the back of my neck went straight up, and I scurried into the house. Um, the second time was late on, an, uh, on a Sunday night. I was finishing up some work in the garage, walked outside to stretch, and, and you know, as God is my witness, there he was again. Uh, same clothing, same position, um, everything about him was exactly the, the same as the first time he appeared to me. Uh, but this time, I wised up a little bit, and I didn't take my gaze off of him. I actually picked up one of those little free newspapers that they deliver to the house once a week and tossed it over, you know, across the street, had it land on the sidewalk right in front of them, and it made quite a noise because it was it was very quiet at that time of the morning. He didn't move. He didn't say anything. He didn't, his gaze didn't change. His, his posture didn't change. He didn't flinch. And this time, you know, I actually asked him what he wanted. You know, why was he here? Why was he showing himself to me? And he never, there was no movement. So I'm wondering if it was a time slip. You know, I was just watching maybe a, a, a very thin veil in the, in the time dimension and this man was here. But in any case, I blinked my eyes and he was gone. Um, so there was no doubt in my mind at that point on the second sighting that, you know, he, it was, it was something more than just Somebody's old dad had walked out of the house and, you know, wandering around the neighborhood. 
the second or the third actually uh, experience I had was at Alcatraz Island in 2015. Never been there, although I'm, a, I'm born and raised here in Redwood City, California. Decided to go out there with an old girlfriend, and um, when you walked into the greeting cell, I guess, where they heard everybody in there, and you put on a set of earphones, and, the rec- and there's a recorded message that comes on. And during this message, I heard a very gruff voice over my right shoulder say, hey, you. And when we were finished, it did it did cause a little bit of electricity through me. But when we were finished, I laughed and I said, oh, that was pretty cool that they put in like some mean sounding convict voice like saying, hey, you in the in the in the recording. And she looked at me and she said, there wasn't anything like that. I didn't hear anything like that. And of course, my blood ran cold. And it was definitely yeah, it was definitely a voice. Um, and again, when I heard it, it was chilling at that time too, but I just passed it off as, again, part of their little show, uh, on the recording to make people kind of get, give people a feel of maybe what kind of personalities they might experience in prison, in the prison setting. So anyhow, uh, that's my, those are my stories. Um, I always keep myself open. Uh, I have been told that I'm an empath, um, I am a social worker. I do hear a lot of stories, and my heart does go out to a lot of people. So I am very emotionally in tune with others. Um, so perhaps that's why spirits that have have presented to me or made themselves known to me. But anyway, I will continue to let you guys know if, if I have any more experiences and continue to listen. I am a loyal fan for life, as long as you guys are on the radio or in any medium. Such as uh, Tim's new program, and Dave, yours. Um, you know, I'm always tuning in and, and catching the, the latest about what you guys are up to. All right, take care, guys. And again, happy birthday, Tim. All right, we will be back tomorrow as we talk about uh, wandering wraiths and pesky poltergeist and more with our guest Jim Hunt. Stay tuned for that because you're not going to want to miss one minute of the best in paranormal talk radio. I'm Dave. That's Tim. This is Darkness Radio. Mm-hmm.